Hello, and welcome to another episode of History Respawned. I'm your host, John Harney. In this episode, we will discuss Tropical 5, the latest installment in the Tropical series from Calypso. This management sim seeks to offer the player the chance to play as a dictator throughout various periods of history in a fictional state, based on colourful interpretations of Caribbean and Latin American history. The game's presentation relies heavily on satire, which creates certain challenges when referencing unpleasant events in the modern history of societies ruled by dictatorships. To discuss these issues, I'm joined by Dr. Renata Keller. Dr. Keller is Assistant Professor of International Relations at Boston University. She is an expert in the history of Latin American international relations and is author of Mexico's Cold War, Cuba, the United States and the Legacy of the Mexican Revolution, which will be published by Cambridge University Press later this year in 2015. We are delighted to have her join us for this episode. Hi, Renny. Welcome to the show. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. We're delighted to have you, and especially for this game, Tropical 5, which, uh, so, you know, it's a game that we maybe will talk about this, Try well, it doesn't just try to have a sense of humor, it's kind of designed as a comedic game, dealing with kind of very problematic theme in many ways, and this concept of dictatorship, I guess, in a, you know, in a random Latin American country, in this case, you know, a small, unidentified island. Um, a lot of the marketing for the tropical games has featured kind of a, you know, a Castro lookalike or a cartoonish version of that. I suppose a great place for us to start, really, you know, with you being the expert, of course, is how historically accurate uh, is this game from what you saw of it? Well, it makes a lot of historical references, like you mentioned, to, to Castro or or Che or revolutionaries, but there are also um, a lot of historical inaccuracies. Uh, one of the main things I noticed, first of all, in the colonial era is, and maybe this it just wasn't in the footage you sent me, but I didn't see anything mm-hmm. about labor um, and specifically slavery, which was a oh, huge of part of the labor system um, throughout Latin America in the colonial period, um, especially in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's something that I, I thought was missing in terms of, you know, you can pick all of your crops and your fields and, and all of that. And I was wondering, <laughs> okay, who, who's working um, these fields? And then in terms of independence, I thought the way that they handled independence was very interesting and that they kept asking you, like, when do you want to declare independence? This is what you have to do to declare independence. When really throughout most of Latin America, it wasn't the leadership that was declaring independence. It was um, it was the Creole elite, people who were locally born um, of Spanish heritage, but they weren't the governors for the most part. Oh, uh, would you mind talking a little bit about this Creole elite then? Because in the game, you know, um, it's kind of, you know, you the player, obviously, is this abstract thing. And you have Lord Oakhart as this, you know, kind of jokey version kind of of the the colonial master giving you instructions and he later becomes it seems like you know you go into debt after you become independent so this creole elite is is just not really present in 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 the game so who who are those people so they were people uh usually the the leadership so whoever you are in the game the leadership were Mm -hmm. people from spain who are designated uh to to run the colonies and the the creole elite were people who are born in the colonies, unlike, you know, they're called peninsulares, people from the Spanish peninsula. Uh, So the Creole elite were people born in the Americas, they were of Spanish descent, but they were barred, for the most part, from uh, government leadership positions, and they they weren't given uh, favorable trade contracts and things like that, and so they were really... um, trying to improve their position. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so they were generally the ones who led these independence movements. And then I I don't know if the game goes into it at all, but there's also this whole role of uh, the Napoleonic Wars in Europe (laughs) that also contributed hugely to the Latin American independence movement. Yeah, the game doesn't mention the Napoleonic Wars at all. What the game does do, and it might not have been in the footage that you saw, the little mechanic they have in that opening section of the game is um, there are two types of people, political actors, basically, in the population that you can appeal to. There's royalists, and then there are rebels. Um, and then very much it's kind of... And, it, you know, it's within this game mechanic. You kind of... You discover the Constitution, you get enough research points, etc., etc., and then you just declare it. And the Crown says, OK, you can either fight us or we will allow you to go $20,000 into debt and you'll owe us money. Um, and that's it. That's how they handle it. 
mm-hmm. you know. So, I mean, I don't know, is is this royalist kind of dynamic? I mean, so so is there is there kind of a rebel thing? I mean, to what extent is, in that early stage, is the game being anachronistic and taking a present idea of a rebel and just saying it was there in 1820? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or, or were there kind of rebellious forces at the time? Uh, well, it's interesting that you mentioned the constitutions because liberalism and liberal constitutionalism did play a big role in the independence mm-hmm. movements and that people, you know, looked at the events that were going on, you know, in the French Revolution and then um, the U.S. War for Independence. And so there was a lot of talk of, um, you know, liberty, equality, fraternity. And so liberalism did play a big role, but... Uh, there, it was really the absence of power that was created when Napoleon took the Spanish king hostage that created this opportunity for hmm. the liberal ideas to really uh, bring about change in the Americas. And then also in terms of the independence wars, they they left out this whole other group, the people who were fighting. <laughs> the, the, the actual soldiers were these, uh, a lot of them were these slaves that I mentioned before. Um, right. So they were the actual soldiers uh, fighting actually on both sides, um, both for independence and then also in the royalist troops. Uh, the military leaders would frequently offer people uh, freedom in exchange for serving in their in their armies. Right. And that's actually I can kind of see why a game released for a Western yeah. audience in 2015 would <laughs> gloss over this. But there's not a lot of... Uh, racial commentary at all in the game you know so you can kind of create your character to start and you could make him or her black if you like or latino or or white or what have you and it but in the game when they kind of confront you with these little you know these uh these talking heads as it were giving you missions essentially they don't really touch on you know racial issues i mean so i mean you could help again educate especially for those of us who know literally nothing about latin america prior to 1945 and so on i mean that that must have been huge right Mm -hmm. yeah the the racial issue was a big uh deal especially in terms of independence when you look at one of the first successful independence movements was in haiti and that was led um by the slaves and then that served as a warning actually to places like puerto rico and cuba that that really when the rest of Latin America was declaring independence, they were much closer to Haiti. And so the the leadership there was much more afraid of having um, similar changes in terms of, you know, racial distributions of power. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so another issue that that I was wondering about is, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a funny game, like you mentioned, the, where you can choose your, your race at the beginning. Um, I wonder whether that affects uh, how things play out, because there were definite patterns. Like I said, for most of the colonial period, it was a Span- white Spanish elite who were in charge. And then they entirely skip over the, the 19th century. And in the 19th century, it was actually mestizo elites who were in charge of, in a lot of areas. Um, and so the the leadership kind of shifts in different periods. Um, mm-hmm. That's something as well in the game. And, and again, part of it is, you know, this is a game that has expanded over the various iterations from being, you know, a couple of iterations ago, you were basically kind of a Castro style figure running what was a, what was pretty much Cuba from 1930 or so to 1970, you know, or some, so it's kind of, you know, uh, prior to World War II up to Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, in that creation, I mean, that's a good question. I actually don't know if I had created a black character. Would there have been more black characters? I, I doubt it, to be perfectly honest. But also, you know, the character I created, you know, Ulysses Diaz. And again, the game is not trying to be serious, so you can put him in a spaceman costume if you want. But they have these kind of, you know, very kind of stereotypical um, popul- popular imagination ideas of what, quote unquote, a dictator looks like. And so they just kind of take that idea from like ni- 1970s, for example, and just put it back in you start off in quote-unquote the colonial period uh, and they throw some dates down to kind of give you a sense but it's kind of there's there's a lot of mixing and matching there that was something i wanted to ask you about rennie in terms of this game for again partly for mechanical reasons likes to divide um the history of this you know unnamed nation into colonial era kind of world wars as they call it world wars plus interwar cold war and then eventually modern times you mentioned that you skipped the 19th century. I mean, to what you know, what kind of chronological issues kind of jumped out to you while you were watching the footage? 
Well, the 19th century, especially in a game that's focused so much on nation building, like that was really when nation building was going on, right? After they mm -hmm. declared independence, um, and people had these these ideas about, okay, we should be a, a constitutional republic. Uh, what does that mean to be a constitutional republic? Uh, and then also in terms of developing the economies, because I did notice that in the game, you, you have to go into debt to declare independence, or you can. And that's what happened across the board. These countries were uh, really suffering economically after they declared independence, even because the, the wars were so destructive. It, uh, a lot of the, for example, mines were flooded, the fields were burned. Um, and so it took a long time in the 19th century to recover. But then when they did, that was really when people started um, developing these new, what they call the more neo-colonial economies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's when, you know, you're, you're building all of these fields and buildings and palaces and schools. And the 19th century is really when a lot of this is happening. And so it, right. it completely skips over that period. <laughs> Yeah, in the game, you you have the kind of rebellious figure. She comes to you and says, "We need we need a library." And in the mechanics yes. of the game, the library creates research points. You can discover other things. I guess that's the representation, I suppose, of of what was going on. I'm not sure. I mean, mm, obviously, yes, that's there very were a lot slight. of educational projects. Uh, I'm I'm more familiar with the Mexican example, but a lot of these uh, leaders were interested in spreading. Um, First of all, just basic literacy. Most of the population mm -hmm. was illiterate, uh, and so uh, and and with these educational projects, the idea was that you would create uh, create citizens who would then um, vote, but they weren't allowed to vote until they were literate. Uh, and so it, oh, wow. it was all these qualifications of who was a, allowed to be a citizen, and and education was a big part of it. It's fascinating, and in, in the game, you know, you can click on individual citizens of your little nation, and it tells you if they're literate or not, and if they're happy or not, and all these kind of mm -hmm. little things. And the game tries to hold your hand a little bit and guide you through, you know, you need high school graduates before you can have such and such a kind of a facility, um, you know, which which I guess again is kind of interesting. Although the game is building to this, you know, having a, having a nuclear power plant, having again this very kind of 1950s kind of style, mm -hmm. or 1960s, you know, this kind of exaggerated idea of dictatorships. In terms of moving forward, then, kind of into the Cold War period of the game, which is something, of course, you know an awful lot about, you didn't see a huge amount of it, I guess, in terms of interactions with other nations, I suppose, as depicted in the game. But how did that come across to you? And, and when do we, you know, the game, the whole point of the game is you're, you're playing as, as a dictator. When do these dictators, you know, and again, our popular imagined idea of them, when do they really come on that scene anyway? I mean. It's the 19th century that they skip over, the neo-colonial era. So that's when they started reaching out to the U.S., to Great Britain, to investors in both of those countries to get um, to get money to, to rebuild their national economies. And so that's when uh, U.S.-Latin American ties really start becoming much more important is toward the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of importance on the world scene, uh, it's the, the World War part. I found really interesting in the game, just because in World War, in World War One, Latin America really wasn't very involved. Uh, in World War Two, they all eventually sided with the United States. Uh, the Caribbean countries were the first actually to align with the U.S. and to, to declare war on the Axis after Pearl Harbor. Uh, but they they. They weren't involved in the fighting at all. Mexico and Brazil were the only countries that were at all involved in the fighting, and they certainly weren't invaded. Uh, really, Latin America more, they contributed uh, material and food to the war effort. Right, yeah, because in the game, that's what I was going to say, and the way they do it in the game is there's this, this trade mechanic, and basically you can sell things to the Axis, or you can sell things to the wet, to the Allies, and this affects your standing, and if the standing drops too low, you get invaded by the Germans, or mm -hmm. by the Americans, and so that's just completely preposterous from an historical point of view, basically. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So would you mind expanding a little bit more on the role of America, though, in, 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 in uh, you know, obviously, again, we're talking about very, very different countries here. So if you wanted to highlight, you know, Mexico or, or a specific example, you should feel free. Like, what's America's developing relationship? I'm sure most people watching know about the Monroe Doctrine and things like that. But obviously, there's a lot more complexity to it. Mm -hmm. So the Monroe Doctrine, when, when Monroe declared it, it was really 
more aspirational <laughs> than anything <laughs> else. Uh, at that point in the early 1800s, early 19th century, the U.S. just didn't have uh, the power to really uh, declare the Western Hemisphere, you know, under U.S. protection. Right. But by the end of the 19th 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, it was uh, more yeah, case that the U.S. Uh, was asserting a greater role, um, both in terms of of military power and in terms of economic power. And in multiple countries, uh, in the Caribbean basin and in Mexico, uh, the U.S. would intervene militarily, beginning again at toward the end of the 19th century and, and in the first few decades of the 20th century, uh, whenever they saw. Uh, what they perceived as Latin American countries misbehaving. So uh, mm -hmm. if it looked like a country is about to default on its debt, and, and European countries would sometimes invade to collect debts. And so the U.S. would invade first and take over the customs houses and um, make sure that, you know, these, especially Caribbean countries, were being responsible and that they were paying their debts uh, And so this, this issue of U.S. involvement was um, increasingly important in the early 20th century and really until Franklin Roosevelt took over and instituted uh, the good neighbor policy. It was a general practice that the U.S. intervened time and time again and sometimes had these very long um, occupations, especially in uh, the Dominican Republic and Haiti, in order to kind of manage The, the local affairs of various Latin American countries. That's fascinating. And, and how, how violent were these occupations? Um, I mean, is it a kind of a case of just arriving and it being a fait accompli, they could take care of these custom houses and so on? I mean, do you, were there flare-ups where you see again in the game, obviously it's cartoonish, people are showing up and firing missiles at buildings and crushing infrastructure and stuff. I mean, I'm assuming that wasn't really happening much in these occupations. It would be self-defeating, no? Mm -hmm. So they were violent in some cases but like you say it's exaggerated in the game so they don't you know raise entire cities right they they come in they take control um and usually the the militaries the local militaries just weren't strong enough to resist so instead of military battles you get local resistance efforts more more sort of like guerrilla warfare and so that's where a lot of the violence came in is with these Uh, small groups of resistance uh, and, and putting down and preventing uh, local resistance was where a lot of the violence came in. Mm -hmm. and, and tell me, so how much, you know, talking about, you mentioned uh, Caribbean nations in particular coming over to the American side, quote unquote, and everything else. I mean, the game, and again, I think a lot of this is the way the game is designed to give the player something to do, but there is this idea of kind of going to one camp or the other. I mean, to what extent are the extent are these nations free agents? And is there kind of, you just talked about the occupations and so on. Is there like a definitive moment or like early 20th century where that's not really valid anymore? Or is that a dynamic that continues throughout into the Cold War? This idea that in theory, you know, Cuba or whichever country could ally with the Soviets rather than the Americans or, or, or whatever it is. Well, Cuba is such an interesting uh, exception because generally mm -hmm. it's the smaller countries that have less room for maneuver. And so places like Mexico and Argentina and Brazil are, well, in Mexico's case, it's big enough and Argentina and Brazil, they're also far enough away from the U.S. <laughs> so they have more room for maneuver. And so Argentina remained uh, unaligned in World War II until I think the last few months of the war. Um, Uh, because they had such a big German and Italian population and they had a lot of ties with both countries. And so, uh, and they were able to do so. Uh, but mm -hmm. in general, smaller countries, and especially ones that are closer to the U.S., like the ones in the, Car in the Caribbean, um, didn't have as much room for maneuver. And the way that the local elite would stay in charge was through their ties with the United States and through their local military ties. And so it was in, it was you know, in their favor, it, it helps them maintain power by aligning themselves with the United States. And then the, the United States would provide, you know, like weapons and funding mm -hmm. and loans, things like that. Right. And of course, Cuba is the exception. Now, in the game, um, your rebel character, she approaches you and says, good news, there's been a revolution in Russia. Um, <laughs> if we pay $10,000, we can have the rev we can have socialism here. 
Um, I'm assuming that's... I, I can only hope that's not an accurate representation of how socialism arrived in Latin America. <laughs> would you mind expanding for us a little bit for the audience of, of, of how, did, how did such ideas kind of spread uh, to that part of the world? Yeah, and and how, did, how did they take root? I mean, Castro is obviously this iconic figure historically, but I'd love to hear you talk about it. No, no, I thought that game in the the part in the game was so strange because it <laughs> certainly wasn't the government, you know, importing communism. Uh, they they would never have done that. Uh, it was a lot of these immigrant populations. Uh, I mentioned the Italian and and German immigrants in Argentina, but there were uh, millions of of Europeans immigrating all over Latin America. Argentina received a lot of them, but a lot of them went to Brazil and Mexico. And so a lot of these ideas, um, both socialism and communism and, and all different varieties of, of each, uh, especially beginning in the early 20th century, were, were discussed throughout Latin America. And then they developed kind of their own versions of it, like Peronism, which uh, was not socialism, not capitalism, somewhere in between. Um, but it, it was more... Uh, from the bottom up rather than right. something uh, imported and imposed from above. Yeah, you know, as someone really who, who writes and teaches, of course, about this kind of thing, I mean, I'm actually not an American, of course, as people have guessed by now if they didn't know already. <laughs> um, but certainly I think an American, and, and to a certain extent I think a Western view of kind of Latin American governments are very, at least socialist movements in that region, it, it all comes tied up in this, again, this very iconic image of Castro, which isn't necessarily a, 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 um, an accurate view either. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, how do you feel? I mean, how do you like to, or how would you introduce that? There's obviously lots of different things going on across, you know, what is basically a whole continent. You know, like, why do you think that we, I mean, I guess it's the American-Cuban relationship. Why do we tie so much up in Castro and what are we missing? Like you just mentioned Pironism. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the viewers wouldn't have heard of that too much before, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I think people focus so much more on Castro because because he's familiar and because he's mm-hmm. the exception, and it's an easy story, or it's an easier story to tell, uh, and it has you know a, a central hero and a or a villain, however you you view him, he's he's easier to um, to characterize or to um, I guess to stereotype than a lot of of other Latin American leaders like Perón, who was, um, it, it's harder to pin him down, H- harder to pin down Perón because he, he created his own movement and he remained independent to a greater degree than, than Castro was able to do. And so, whereas Castro had to align with someone given his, you know, it was a cold war is a different circumstance. Mm-hmm. Uh, Perón didn't have to, and so he was able to kind of um, find the middle ground in a way that's more confusing to to Americans. Right. Yeah, and and that that's actually interesting. So that's something. I mean, maybe we could argue the game gets in there the back door in the sense that it does give you that sense of kind of going for one side or the other. Um, but again, you know, perhaps it gets there kind of uh, the long way. Um, something that the game has a lot of, and we were talking about this before we just started recording, you know, you can click on an individual citizen of, you know, Tropico, of this fictional place, and you can see all these things about them, like their age, their children, uh, are they happy, where do they live, etc., etc. And then you have options. You can bribe them to come over to your side or to mm-hmm. like you, I suppose. They can, You can incarcerate them. You can kill them. Uh, I think once you've researched the appropriate technology and so on. The game also has these running jokes that, you know, you reluctantly have to hold an election and then you have a chance to, like, fix um, an election. Uh, There's a kind of... I guess I have kind of a couple of questions here. We can go through them one by one. I guess, first of all, I... Or we could talk about how appropriate it is and not to kind of criticize the game too much, but I felt weird sometimes knowing what I do about these dictatorships and particularly in Latin America with disappearances and all these kind of terrible things that have gone on in various countries it's odd to have a game that kind of has jokes about that Mm -hmm. Um, and then to help us kind of get into that conversation maybe you could expand a little bit on you know these dictatorships or at least these quote-unquote non-democratic governments what kind of challenges are facing the population once they took control in places I mean there's Argentina Guatemala you know 
the game has a very interesting mixture. You can have clinics, you can bring in public health care, and you can still retain the right to kind of imprison people without trial. You know, so so what what kind of what, what did these kind of governments? What kind of actions were they taking against their populations? And and as 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 just someone who obviously dedicated their life to this field, how how do you feel about trying to get comedic capital out of that? Mm-hmm. It is strange. It it did make me a little uncomfortable that they were joking about. I, I didn't I didn't see anything about disappearances, which was a huge problem and remains a huge problem uh, throughout Latin America. Um, but that you could so easily opt to kill someone and that would resolve problems for you in the game and and it did and that and that's the thing it is to some extent it is historically accurate but the way that they're treating it is mm. problematic um and that they're doing so in such a, a kind of a light-hearted and even comedic fashion is is odd and it's odd that they're giving that option as a way to to benefit and to do better in the game um, but then it's I, I'm thinking of other treatments of tragic issues like I'm thinking like the movie life is beautiful and and that movie had funny moments but it was also sensitive and I think so I don't want to say across the board it's not it's not all right to to mm-hmm. laugh about things, but I think it's the way that you do it that um, that's important. And I think sometimes this game kind of crosses the line in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I that's kind of why I asked the question. I suppose I should be. I I don't think you got a chance to see. There is a mechanic that if you start doing things like that, then rebels will rise up. So you can't just kind of do it indiscriminately. Um, but I agree. It's just it's it's odd to see. You know, um, I'm actually reading a book now uh, that mentions the, you know, President Zaire Mobutu back in the 70s who took 300 people before the Muhammad Ali fight, 300 criminals, and just killed 50 at random to scare the other ones, you know. And these kind of, there's this very interesting relationship between the treatment of individuals within the state and maintaining public order and everything else. And and so I think the game is trying to take a position on it, but it it seems like a very difficult line to to walk, you know. Mm -hmm. It is. It is a, a... A tough issue, and I'm glad to hear that they that there are consequences for those kind of actions in the game. I wonder how um, consistent the game is. Like, if you try and take a more peaceful approach to development, uh, I wonder how consistent that is in terms of like, will that option then disappear, or is it always available? Yeah, well, actually, it's interesting. You know, I I kind of recorded some footage for this uh, for this episode kind of showing Cold War era and Colonial era, but we could talk a little bit too about what comes on, something the game does do. So, you know, you can lose, basically. If, if you upset the rebels too much, you can't really survive it. But um, what the game, you have this modern time section of the game, and you can, you know, you can move, move on from someone who is, you know, holding nukes, basically, for the Russians into a nation that has eco-tourists, and you can build hang glider, uh, you know, hang glider kind of resorts and things like this. So there's a very kind of interesting option of kind of uh, merging into quote unquote like a, a modern or certainly a 21st century kind of economy and state and so in the game you can have clinics and tourists mm-hmm. um, and things like that I mean that's something as well you know what kind of what kind of legacies have been left for all these countries like even today in 2015 I mean these were these were governments you know and again like you say like things aren't perfect in Latin America now either I mean, Cuba at the moment is a very interesting example for the U.S. because we're not sure. There have been major developments in the last six months. We're not sure where things are going. Like, what, what kind of legacies are left for these countries today? Well, there are significant legacies, um, especially in Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, uh, a lot of the people still in charge or who are now being elected into power, with the exception of Cuba, obviously, uh, were involved in these Central uh, Central American civil wars in during this during the Cold War, um, and so uh, you still have a lot of the same battles being fought, but in different ways. Now they're still trying to figure out what to do about crimes that were committed during the civil wars, um, mostly on the part of the government. Uh, you know whether reparations are needed or various forms of historical memory projects. Uh, Just this weekend, uh, Oscar Romero 
Todd is got beatified and so he's you know on his way to becoming a saint and he was killed during the the cold war as as a result of um his stance and his efforts to to denounce the the violence on the part of the government and so there's people are still trying to decide um how to move forward from all of this violence and even now that most uh governments in Latin America are democratically elected, there is still this issue of um, whether people trust democracy and whether they think it's, uh, whether they think it's stable enough, um, how democratic the leadership actually is. And so a lot of these, these questions still remain. Right, and I mean, uh, and so obviously, again, this is going to vary country to country. But like, our can party politics be particularly volatile? And I mean, you mentioned the, the the problems of historical public projects and things like this. So, I just I hope I'm not asking you to repeat yourself. So, is there an issue of people, either people in power now, or people whose proteges are in power, who who we know are directly responsible for for people just disappearing? Is that is that kind of a central issue? Uh, in it some is. Yes, in um, in Guatemala, the the current president was uh, in the military. He was one of the military leaders during the civil wars there. Uh, let's see what other examples. On the other side, in Brazil, Dilma Rousseff uh, was imprisoned during mm. um, during the dirty war there in Brazil. And so you have people on both sides uh, of the political spectrum now in in leadership. And then you still have the same group in power in Cuba, that uh, the Castro family. Right. So, I, guess, I suppose to, to, to wrap things up then, in terms of you know the game again focuses on this dictatorship. I mean, um, just ask you a very general question about what you know what what role do you think then? Obviously, this game is not trying to be an historical book or anything like that. I mean, it's it's a theme, right? It's a setting. Mm-hmm. But how, you know, these, you know, military juntas and, and, and these dictatorships are obviously, you know, things that happened. And kind of going on for the legacy question, you know, what kind of conversations are you, do you hope we're going to be having about these periods of these countries' histories going forward? I mean, this video game is part of that conversation, but in a very, I don't know if light heart is the right term, but in a, in a very different kind of way. I mean, how do you think, what, how would you like just to incorporate, for example, High Castroism. I'm sure that isn't even a term, or or the Argentinian Guatemalan governments. Like, how how do we handle that as historians? You think, and and in the more public conversation. That's a good question. I think it is good that this is at least starting conversations about Latin American history because really in in the U.S. school system, Latin America is kind of frequently shunted to the side, uh, despite all the the close ties. And so I think the fact that it's um, exposing more people to that part of the world and getting them interested in the history and questioning, okay, how much of this game is accurate? What are they referring to when they, you know, make these jokes? I think in terms of just sparking curiosity, it's it's really good and I'm glad that it exists in that respect. And I hope that it that it does do that, that it sparks curiosity and that it doesn't stand as the full story. But I think if people understand that it is based somewhat in in what happened, but it, it takes creative license with it. And I think if people understand that and then, you know, make the effort to kind of take the next step and and read or, you know, watch documentaries or something like that, mm-hmm. I think, uh, as long as they continue that conversation, I think that's the important part. Great. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much again for joining us, Rennie. Oh, yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, and thanks everybody for watching. We'll definitely see you next time. Um, and we look forward to seeing you for the next episode. Goodbye. Bye.